we will look at this the scatter plot. Let me just get that out of the way. And there is a question, and I know you guys have the note in front of you as well. So we just read that. There's like a graph given of bottles of water that we sold at the tuck shop. If you see some spelling mistakes, just ignore that for now, please. That can be fixed later on by the officials. And then they say the least square regression line for this data is drawn on the scatter plot. Let me just quickly explain what that means. Just quickly, quickly, quickly. So you see all these dots, and they are now plotted points, as you know. If you look at the top table there, you see there's temperature on the what we normally call the x-axis and the number of bottles on the y-axis, and then we now go plot the points. Now, what is this least regression line, also called the line of best fit? That's exactly what it is. It's a line, you know, normally when these dots fall in a line, then we can you know, you can join all of them with one line, but now they're all over the place, so you can't. So this is the line that fits this picture, this story, the best, if that makes sense. Um, line of best fit or that least square regression line, blah, blah, blah. that's the other nice name, name for that. So there you see at the top, you see the 18 and the 12. And there you go, so we plot that. Um, there are two types of questions I can ask you, if you can just concentrate on this. They can either give you the information, like you see it now, and then you have to plot the points, or, and a lot of times, most of the times, they actually give you the sketch, because it saves time, and then they ask you questions based on the sketch. But there we go, there's the orange one, the 21 and 15, and we plot that. And so we go all of them and we plot all of them. Now we have them. Okay, so that's just basically that. So you must know how to, to how to sketch that. So like you did in grade eight and nine with the lines, you you read off the x value, you read off the y value, you make the dot, and then we sketch a line that fits it best. Now that line that you sketch. Um, will be not 100% accurate at the moment, which is why we say it's a line of best fit. Before we go on with that, now just look at this page. Unfortunately, you have to know this. So if you can see, um, you know that we said from grade 9, I think, if a line lies like that, then it's positive. And if we go to the bottom and it lies like that, it's negative, meaning it's a negative gradient. I just want to go back there because it ran away from me now. Don't want it to go away. Yeah, so you see all of that. Some of them are bunched together strongly. We say strong positive or moderate positive. And if they are all over the place like that, there's, we say there's no correlation which means there's no relationship between the values on the X and the values on the Y. Strong negative, so that's, that's easy to remember. What is not so easy to remember is what you see on the right-hand side, what they call the correlation coefficient. And they have a, a name there called absolute value, which used to be in the grade 12 syllabus, but not anymore. That's something that you get with your calculator. So you will unfortunately have to know that, you know, if it's a 0, 0,2, then it's very low, 0, 0,5, low, and so on, and so on, and so on. And the closer it gets to 1, the more perfect the fit becomes. So 0, 0,9, 0, 0,95, 0, 0,93, anything like that would be a very high correlation, which means there's a very strong relationship between the X and the Y values. So if you could look at this page just quickly, can you see again? Just a repeat of what we just said, there's a, almost a perfect positive correlation because it's in a line, and then your calculator will give you one. That's a positive correlation, very strong, but it's not in a line, so that will be close to one, and so on, and so on, and so on. Um, if, if the calculator, when you do that, uh, 
that coefficient number that I just spoke about, sorry, <clears throat> and you get zero, it means that there is absolutely no relationship between the X values and the Y values. Then sometimes they talk about an outlier. You can see this comes from June 2016. Now an outlier is a number that is sort of way out, you know? If you look at this graph that you can see, you'll see that most of these little dots are fairly close to this line. Are you able to find a number that's way out of line that it's almost like people sitting in a group and having a chat and then there's this one person sitting way outside on his own or on her own. Are you able to see the outlier? Yep. The equation of this line, how do we do that? And then it says at the bottom, number 2.3, that we must now estimate. Estimate almost means guess, but not really. It means that we're going to read off something from this graph. And the answer is not going to be perfect. So it's going to be an, an estimate, an approximation. OK, there's the one that's sitting on his own or on her own. That's the outlier. So we will have to be able to read that off. Um, you have to be able to see it, the one that's sitting on its own. And then you have to be able to read it off. Are you able to read it off? Of course, the x value first, like we always do, which is 30. That one's easy. Can you see it's on that line? And then the Y value is not so easy to see. But in this case, it's 53. So that would be the outline. That would probably count just one mark. Now, the equation of this thing. And your textbook will have all those steps in there. If you do not have a Casio calculator, then the steps are different. And you will have to ask your teacher or a tutor, or a friend, or Google, or the little booklet that comes with the calculator to help you with the steps. But those are the steps that we have to follow. Can you see that we, remember this is now revision, so we're going to go quite fast. So the X values, the 18 and the 21, there they are, the 18, the 21, the 19, the 26, they all go in this column. And then the Y values, the 12, the 15, the 13, the 31, the 46, they all go in that column. And then, as you can see, the calculator will give you three things. It will give you an A value. Sometimes it's a capital, sometimes it's a small A, it doesn't matter, it's all the same. It will give you a B, and then it, you have to write down the equation. Now, what I have found over the years is that people get this, the calculator step correct and wonderful, well done. But then they get confused with which one is the A, you know, and which one is the B. So make sure you guys know that. So the B, can you see there, is the one that goes next to the X. That's almost like the gradient that we used to have. And then the other one is the C value, the constant. And this is a guaranteed question. They're going to ask you a question like that. Now they're going to go that we must estimate the number of 500 milliliters bottles of water that will be sold if the temperature is 28, 28, 28. So we must now go on the x axis. Where is 28? Where is 28? Where is 28? 25, 26, 27, 28. See that? And then you have to go up, up, up. You're going to see it in a moment. And then you're going to go over to the bottles and then read it off. Your answer is not going to be perfect. So you know, if you are out by one or so, they will still give you the mark. But of course, you can also put it into the equation, which now isn't really estimate, because estimate really means that you should get it from the graph. But it's totally up to you. So whether you get it from the graph, you know, whether you go and see, okay, 28 on the graph, and then go up to the line, and then go over left until you get to the number of bottles, read it all from there, or you can put it into the equation that you have, and then we say 36,53. Now, of course, you can't have 36,53 bottles, so the number of bottles should actually then be 36 or 37. Let's see what it says now. June 2016 still refer to the scatter pot. Would you say that the relationship between the temperature at midday 
and the number of bottles is weak or strong. So you have to say weak or strong for one mark probably, and then you have to give an answer, motivate your answer. And then the second question is going to be, do you think that you can continue with this line forever? I know they're using big formal English words. Give a reason why this observed trend cannot continue indefinitely. And then we will have to talk about that. But from your previous calculation, you, your R value was almost one, which means that it's almost a perfect relationship. You know, do you remember that I said one is perfect? A perfect relationship? Then all the points would be in a straight line. This is very close. So I would say this is a very strong positive relationship. Now, why can this line not continue forever, indefinitely, forever? Just think about it. What is the bottom line? That's temperature, is it not so? So we're already at 40 degrees. Think practically. Is it possible for temperature to just go on forever, forever, forever? And you have to answer that by writing a little story. It's probably two marks or so for that. Something like temperature can't get that hot. You know, if it becomes 50 or 60, then you can't live anymore. People will start dying. Water will start boiling, you know, at 100 and so on. Um, anything like that that makes good sense will give you your marks. You'll see different answers there. They always come up with a, 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 an almost like an open-ended question where you can basically write anything that makes sense. But you mustn't just waffle. It must make sense. Okay, guys, now we come to the you do part. Um, sorry if you're not done yet, but um, we have to do this now. Can you see there's a mark for the A and the B? That's simply with the calculator. And then you write down the equation. Now, if your A value is incorrect, and your B value is incorrect, but then you write down the equation using your A and your B values, you will still get that last mark. Okay, so you won't lose all the marks there. S sketching this thing, there are many ways of sketching that. Can you see there's two marks for a correct slope? It must go through at least two of the points. So you can use any of the two points. It says this one or that one or that one or that one or that one, um, and then sketch it. So that will be two marks for that. Um, why do you think this would be in dotted lines there? Because that's not part of the actual values that you have. But you know, just to continue this line, so it has, it goes through the y-axis, so it has a y-intercept there. Then 1.3, it says predict. Now, like I said earlier, you can do it two ways. You can actually read it off from the graph. A lot of people will like that. Or... You can sub it into the equation like it shows the this calculator is actually for that. So either read it off, so just two marks, wrong or right. And then if you use the calculator, then it's one for knowing to substitute and one for getting the answer. Then the R value is what you would have got when you, you know, when you had the, 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 had the tables and you subbed all those values into the calculator. Calculator would have given you the small a, the small b, and the small r. Now, the a and the b we use for the equation, but the r, that tells us how strong the correlation is. Can you see this is a positive number? So, in other words, it lies like that, and it's extremely close to 1. And that helps us to answer the next one. It's a very, very, very strong correlation. So what does that mean? So because a lot of people struggle with the language there, they won't be able to answer 1.6 correctly. Let's just break it down quickly. What does it mean if they say there's a strong positive correlation? Let's use simple and maybe even bad English. If there's a, a strong positive correlation, it means if the math mark is high, the physics mark will be high. You know? If the math mark is low, the physics mark will be low. So in 1.6, it goes, what trend does the teacher notice? And it's exactly something like that. It says here the teacher concludes the higher the math mark, the higher the physics mark. 
You could have said the lower the physics, the math mark, you know, the lower the physics mark, or the higher the math mark, the higher the physics mark. Any of that would have given you that answer. Now, these questions that you see over here, can you see that's 2020? That's not long ago. So this is the kind of question that you guys can and must expect. Now, there's another one. This one says 10 minutes. It says keep in mind, track class, that even if the A value and the B values are incorrect, but you use them and you write down the equation from that, you will still get the third mark. And then it, when it comes to the prediction equation, that's 1.2, and you substitute that value into the equation that you have, whether your equation is now correct or not, you will still get that mark or those marks as well. If it's two marks, you will get the two marks there. I always say to my grade 12, more or less, a mark a minute so if it says 10 marks then probably about 10 minutes or so you know if it takes longer then you're not going to have enough time for the really challenging questions let's see there remember we always round off to two decimals unless the question bible tells you differently so the a value one mark the b value one mark and then the equation then you can read it off from the graph or you can substitute it in that means you might get different answers but that's fine remember if you use the calculator then and you do the substitution then show always show one mark for substituting one mark for the answer if you read it off from the graph then it's just right or wrong you know you read it off and you give them the answer and it's either correct two marks or not and then there's the R value, which is a very strong positive, but they just asked you to get that. And then this answer is a tough question. It says the, the D value is the correct one. And if you want to um, explain that, you'll say it's an outlier. Or if you do sketch it, you'll see that this point 18,000 and 9,000, it lies extremely far from the line of best fit. So it's an outlier. So that's not a good one. Okay, guys, can you see there's a lot of practice? So here we go. It says there that you must select the correct R value for 2.2, which one fits the plotted data best. So you must look at the trend, you know. Um, if these dots are all very close to the line, then the R value must be close to 1. That's the one thing. If these dots seem to form a line that goes that way, you know, that way, can you see that? The little laser pointer that way, then it's positive. If these dots seem to form a line that goes this way, then it's going to be negative. So if they lie close to this, then it's going to be a, a number that's close to 1. And if it lies all of them going this way, more or less, then it's going to be positive. And if they lie more or less like that, you know, like a negative gradient we had from grade 9 and 10, then it's going to be a negative R value. So that should be fairly easy for you to get that one mark. And then for 2.2.2, you now have to give a reason. You have to motivate. So, you know, it's you can guess correctly and get your one mark and then try and give a reason. Why did you choose that one? So, guys, let's look at this quickly. What is the fastest speed so we can read that off easily? There we go. So we must all get that mark. To me, these dots seem to form that kind of trend and not this kind of trend. So to me, B is out. So it's either going to be A or C. And um, they don't lie close to the this. So it can't be 0, 0,93 because that's almost one. What does the data suggest? Now, to me, it doesn't suggest a lot. 
because what they are hoping for is that the taller you are, the faster you serve. But is it true? Where is the tallest guy? Over here is the tallest guy, but he doesn't serve as fast as the others. But we'll see now. And then 2.4 is why is it not possible for this line to go through that point? <laughs> brilliant, brilliant answer. So they were at the speed, and of course it couldn't have been the one that's close to one, so it must be that one. And then you must give a reason. Well, they're fairly scattered, you know. They're not totally scattered, but they're fairly scattered to so something like that. And I would have said <coughs> there's no conclusive evidence. You know, if you look at this one, you, it's not possible to say that the taller a person is, the faster they serve. Because you can look at this person that's not so tall as all the others, but serving, you know, quite fast, and then you have another person there, and serving very fast, and then you have a very tall guy there, serving not so fast. So there's no conclusive evidence that how tall you are influences how fast you serve. No conclusive evidence. Um, you can see it from the graph. You can also see it from the R value. It's it's scattered, you know. There's no real trend. And then the one that made me smile, 2.4, if you take this point, it means that you, your height, how tall you are, is zero. <laughs> so you have zero height, but you can still serve at 27. That's impossible. that the range, and I see that lots of grade 12s um, and grade 11s um, confuse range in graphs where you have domain and range with the range in stats. Now, it's not the same thing. Of course, the range in stats is the highest minus the lowest. Most people get full marks for that. And then now these things, the quartiles. So these are the formulas for them, but please note, and this is very important, I'm speaking from experience, that these formulas, they do not give you the quartiles, they give you the position, the place, the put placement, where the, the actual the quartile is, the position in the row of numbers, where that is. Um, for one, when one is, if one is very interested in mathematics, then you can go and Google why it's n plus one and not n like some books are showing, but there's no time for that now actually quite easy to show that and then you must also know the interquartile range the you know q3 minus q1 so these things one must know very well then guys a guaranteed question there is going to be a box and whiskers i've got these strange names for these things mountain snore and afrikaans box and whiskers there's going to be a question like that either they're going to ask you to sketch one and then write all the labels that go with it, or they might give you one and then ask you questions on that. So for the box and whiskers, you need to know the five number summary. Sometimes they don't ask you the box and whiskers, they simply ask you to write down the five number summary, which probably counts five marks or maybe three or so. So the five number summary will be the highest number, the maximum, the lowest number, and then the Q3, the Q2, and the Q1, those three things. So we must be able to get that, like I just said. Can you see? The highest, the lowest, and then the three Qs, if I could call them that. If you can look at the box of whiskers, and I'm going to spend a bit of time on this because a lot of people don't get full marks for the box of whiskers, and you should. So over here, you should have the lowest number. Over there, it's the highest number. Then Q1, Q2, and Q3. Then below that, you should have some kind of scale or some kind of ruler, because you cannot expect that anonymous person marking your work in November or December to think for you. Remember, they don't know you. You're just an exam number to them. So if they can't see, let's say you have Q2 up here, and they can't see what that number is, 
you're not going to get that mark. So we have to be very clear about that. Okay, like I just said, those are the five numbers that must be shown on the box of whiskers. And of course, they're all 25% because that's what quartile means. It means quarter, 25%, 25%, 25% of that. And of course, in the Q2 is in the middle. There's just a little typing mistake there. Can you see it's median? So another name for median is the second quartile. So that's the one that's exactly in the middle. This one is exactly symmetrical, can you see? It looks exactly the same on the left as it looks on the right. The one is a mirror image of the other side. So if you should draw a line in the middle over here, almost like a parabola kind of thing, you know, then the one kind is a perfect reflection of the other one. This one is totally skewed. Now, lots of people get that wrong. We say that is skewed to the left or negatively skewed. Skewed to the left, can you see that? The other one is skewed to the right. That basically means too much on the side, you know, skewed to the right, it means too much on that side. And it shows you a picture of whatever the numbers are that you are using. Let's say these are the numbers of um, exam marks, you know, if it's like up here, then it's almost perfect, symmetrical. You would expect that if it looks like this. Then you have too many people on this side, too many marks on this side, and then on this one you have too many or too many marks on that side. This comes from June 2016. Now, to you, it sounds like years and years ago. What's that, six years ago? So you were probably about grade seven, eight-ish. To us, older people, it's like yesterday. So we're going to go through them because they are going to ask you the same kinds of questions every, every, every single time. When you get these numbers, you will remember, hopefully from grade 8 and 9, that you must always rearrange them first from the lowest to the highest. Let's just count them quickly. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 11 and it says 11 so i'm just checking that that's the same as that the table shows the number of passengers on each bus so this tour company is sending out 11 buses and then it's showing you the number of passengers on each bus so just to make sure you understand on the first bus you have eight people and then on the last bus you have 26. then there was also something silly like that and you must get full marks for that probably two marks Calculate the mean number of passengers traveling in a tour bus. Mean, now when we talk about mean, we never say mean, we say average. You know, like when you have two tests and you want to get the average of the test, then you add the two and you divide by two. That's what that means. So bad English word for mean is the average. So there we go. You take your calculator, you add those things, you divide it by 11. Why 11? Because you have 11 buses, and that's it. So there is about, more or less, approximately 17 people per bus. Write down the five number summary. Now, here we go. These are the things that they're going to ask you. Remember, five number summary. Highest number, 26. Lowest number, 8. And now we must get the three Qs. So how do we get the three cues? After we have that, then we have to sketch the thing, draw the box of whiskers diagram, and then we have to say, is it skewed to the left, is it skewed to the right, or is it symmetrical? So let's just see. The median is 19, it's 11, so we, can, we don't even need those formulas for that. Who is exactly in the middle? 19, and then in the middle of that, it's going to be 10, and in the middle of that, it's going to be 24. So you divide it into quarters, so that's easy to see. So the five number summary would be the smallest, the highest, and then the three Qs. Now, to sketch this thing and to get full marks, and normally the box of whiskers counts about four to five marks. So let's see, what must you show? Can you see there's a kind of a scale? like a ruler, just to show, then you must say that this is the lowest or the minimum, that is the highest or the maximum, 
and then this is Q1, Q2, and Q3. Now, if you don't show these numbers, you know, that this one is 10, that one is 19, this one is 24, the person marking your work is not going to do it for you. They're not going to go like this. Um, let's see where this goes. Uh, I think it's 10 and then give you the mark. They're going to go, ah, not shown and not give you the mark. So make sure you have them all in. I would like you to be even more complete on this box of whiskers if you can. So could you just write the label there saying minimum or lowest, maximum or highest, and then write there Q1, Q2, and Q3. To me, that's my personal taste, it's even more complete than what you see over there. And can you see there's the middle? So there's too much on this side. So we say it's skewed to the left. And you know, if you think of a number line to the left is negative and to the right is positive. So skewed to the left, so you can say it's negatively skewed. That's okay. Now we get to the standard deviation. Guys, 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 very, 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 very important. They're going to ask you that. And you see, it starts by saying how to find the standard deviation on a Casio. Now, unfortunately, every, I remember in all my grade 12 classes, grade 11 classes, I always have one or two or three or four or five people who are not working with Casios, but scientific calculus. Now, unfortunately, they will have to kind of find out by themselves or get this one clever child in the class who knows how all calculators work. You know, there's always one person in a class who knows exactly how computers work, who knows exactly how calculators work, or go Google it, you know, or study that booklet that comes with it. I just want to show you something, um, or maybe just tell you what I did for myself is on my cell phone, I downloaded an app called Standard Deviation. Now, of course, you can't use your cell phone in the exams, but I'm talking about in preparation. If you are now preparing for exams and you want to practice a lot and you're not sure if your standard deviation is correct, you know, then without having all these steps that you see there, you could just type in the numbers on that app, a free app on the calculator and out pops the standard deviation and then you can check quickly whether you're correct or not. If your answer is incorrect, then you can go back to see, um, you know, where you went wrong. These are the steps. You'll find these steps all over the place in textbooks, um, all over the place you'll find them. So let's go to June 2016 now. There are the buses again and the standard deviation. So let me talk to you quickly about what the standard deviation means. So I'm just going to escape from this. Hopefully it will work. I'm going to go through to my folio. It will take a little while. Just understand a little bit what standard deviation means. Now, deviate means to be different from. Now, let's say people write a test for some subject. I hope you're concentrating now. And let's say the average of the test is 50%. That's now the mean. And let's say you have this clever child in the class who gets 80% for the test, for that same test. Then can you see there's a deviation, a difference of 30, of plus 30. And then there might be one person in the class who for some reason had, let's say, 10% for that same test. And can you see there's a difference of 40, but it's minus 40%. So the, the standard deviation is one number that describes all these deviations, all these differences from the middle, not the middle, from the average, from the mean. That's the standard deviation. So that's, you know, if you have a class of 20 people, let's say, some of them will have, on the, on the average, on the mean, some of them will have more than the mean, some of them will have less than the mean, but the standard deviation is one number, if I can make it very simple, that describes the, how people differ from the mean. So listen to this quickly. If I say the mean 
is 50%, and I say the standard deviation is 20%. I can I never can make this little symbol the way it should look like. Then it means that the numbers are spread wide. That means you get you get lots of people that are 20% above the mean, and you have lots of people that are below the mean. You see? So the the the, the marks for this test are all over the place. Let's say your average for the class is 50%. And let's say the standard deviation is five. Then it means that all the marks are closely clustered together in a way. You know that more, some of the people are five up, some of the people are five below. Okay, so we have to get the standard deviation. First of all, we have to get the standard deviation. That's always two marks, and that's going to be right or wrong. You can either get the two marks or you don't. Then, and this is a guaranteed question, I just want to change this pointer to the red, um, to the laser pointer, so you can see clearly over here. So there we have the standard deviation, which you must now be able to get using those steps on the Casio. Now, we don't have time to teach you all those steps. Hopefully you did that in your class. You need to go and practice that on your own. And also, if you have the time and you have a little bit of data, download that little free app to your cell phone so you can just check your standard deviation. So th that number is quite small, as you can see. That means that the, the, the numbers are not far away from the, from the middle number, from the mean, not far away. Now it says, a tour is regarded, it's a lot of language, a lot of English, a tour is regarded popular if the number of passengers on a tour is one standard deviation above the mean. One standard deviation above the mean. So what does that mean? You know, it already is very confusing. So I'm going to go back to my folio because I need to explain that. Hopefully you did have that explanation in class, but these are all guaranteed questions. So let's say your mean is for something is 20. And let's say the standard deviation is five. Then one normally would say it's 20 plus minus five, which means that's five above the mean or five below the mean. Can you see it's five above the mean or five below the mean? So that's one standard deviation. If the question says, two standard deviations, then we would go two standard deviations. And then we would go two plus that number, and then we would go two minus that number, just to make you understand what it means when they say one standard deviation above the mean, one standard deviation above the mean, like I showed you there, or two standard deviations, or if the mean is 20 and they say three standard deviations, then it's like that. So very, very, very important questions these. Can you see there now? I'm just going to go back there, current slide. It's the standard deviation. There we have the mean. Can you see that? 17,18. So if I go one standard deviation, then it's exactly like you see it there. It's that plus the standard deviation. If they said two standard deviations, then you would go twice the 6,46 like I just showed you now. So make sure because these are guaranteed questions. Not necessarily these exact words, but like that. There's the mean above one standard deviation. If I change this question and I say a tour is regarded popular if the number of passengers sorry, is two standard deviations above the mean, then you would have a two over here 
in brackets, and then you would go, just get that calculation. So where do they get the 3 from? Well, we have to go check now. 23,64. Oh, it's there. Look at the table. And there. And there. Because 21 is below that. Can you see? So 23,64. It's 24, 25, and 26. So three destinations we have. Very, very important questions these, and there it shows with a little text. And there we have the full memo. Now, if your teacher did what they were supposed to have done, then you would get the notes and you would have the memos and all and all and all um, afterwards. So that's how the answers are, are given as well. Can you see there? That's how the answers are given, except, like I said over here, please say minimum, maximum, and say Q1, Q2, and Q3, just to make it more complete. All right, now we go to November 2020, and it now says you do. Let's quickly check your answers, please. Do you have that? You see, that's how they mark. When we were trained, when we did the training for these um, tutorships, we were told to also tell you how marks are awarded. So if you only write the answer and your answer is correct, then you get two marks. If you only write the answer and your answer is wrong, you lose both marks. But if you do show the steps, how you, you know, the total over 12, that would be one mark. And then for the answer, that would be the second mark. Is your standard deviation correct? Two marks or no marks? And then I see some schools are using this perfectly. That's exactly what it means. If we say above, then it's only the plus. But because the question said within, then it can be above or it can be below. So it's going to be the mean. You know, take away the standard deviation, that would be this, the smallest answer, of course, and then the mean plus the standard deviation, and that will be the largest answer. <clears throat> but then you're not done. Now you must go and count. So you must now see if this is the lowest limit, and that's the highest limit. You must now go to the table there and go see how many of them fall inside there. Are you listening, guys? How many of these numbers up there fall within that? If this is the lowest that is allowed, and that is now the highest that is allowed, how many of these fall within that? So you must actually go and count them. And then it says that the answer is 9. So for knowing that you have to go minus, for knowing that you have to go plus, and then for the answer. And then the answers that were sent through via the... The WhatsApp, um, people chose C. So well done on that. Okay, we need to keep, do this again. First one, as I said before, two marks, answer only, two marks. If your answer is wrong, let's say you make a rounding mistake. And then it, you only write the answer, you don't show the step. Then you lose both marks. So one mark for knowing that you have to add all of them and divide by 15. And then one mark for rounding correctly. Standard deviation, 22,69. Right or wrong? You can't get one out of two. Right or wrong? They both collected the same amount that I saw from most of the answers that were sent through. Well done. Can you see 1.2 point B, it's an explanation. And I love that people say as well, the standard deviation says that the one has a greater variation in tips and the one has a smaller variation in tips. And that makes absolute sense. We need to move on, guys. November 2018, what the heck do we have here? We have a box and whiskers 
that is sketched in a weird way. So there we have all the numbers over there. And there we have the 35, which is the lowest, the 125, can you see the highest? Lowest, highest, Q1, Q2, Q3. When we have large numbers, then we put them in groups, you know, we might say from, from zero to five, you know, from five to 10 or from six to 10, you know, make them in groups, divide them in little groups to make it easier for, for one to deal with them. And that is what they mean by group data. Now, this thing is an OGIVE. I always said OGIVE, but I only re learned recently that my pronunciation was wrong. It's an OGIVE. It's also called the cumulative frequency graph. Cumulative means keep on growing frequency. You know, the, you know, add the frequency to the previous frequency to the previous frequency, it's frequency that keeps on going. And it always, always, always has this kind of shape, an S shape, always. So for that reason, and I'm spending a bit of time on this because it's such an important question. When you sketch this, you cannot use a ruler. You know, when you plot the point, you can't use a ruler to go straight line, straight line, straight line, straight line. It must be a freehand sketch must be a freehand sketch. There are many things that you must remember. So you must sketch the thing. Then, of course, you must have labels on it, on the vertical, on the horizontal. Sometimes, to save time, the Department of Education in the November, December exams, when they set the paper, they already print the grid for you, and then they already give you the labels. But if for some reason, this year in 2022, the question paper does not have the labels on them, then we must give the labels there and there, or we will lose a mark. Also, um, I hope you remember that, that you must also anchor this thing. But we will get to that one step at a time, but we must always anchor that. Now they're using this formula again. You can use N plus one, you can use N, it actually makes no difference. And let me tell you why. Because on the OGIVE, the answers that you give are not accurate. They are approximations. And for that reason, on the memo, an answer, you know, normally an answer would be something like, let's say, 17, and it would be one mark. But because these are approximations and you have to read them off from the graph, and especially if you have a bad handwriting like mine, then my answer is going to be a little different to someone else's, you know? So then the member might say, give the mark if the person has anything from, let's say, from 16 to 19, you know? Instead of where a normal question might be 23, because of these things being approximations, they might say, well, anything from 19 to 24 or something like that, give the mark. For that reason, you can use this formula, which some books use, or you can use the one we just used, you know, the N plus one. It's all the same. There they are. Let's just read this all together. The company recorded the number of messages sent over some days. So two days, 10 to 20, Eight days, you know, 20 to 30. Can you see what they mean by group data? Now, do you remember from grade 10 and the inequalities that this means the 10 is excluded and the 20 is included? Then the 20 is excluded and the 30 is included and so on and so on and so on? Now, you can't get the exact mean. Well, they like asking the estimate or the approximate mean, rounded off to two decimals. And that you did for the first time, I think, or you should have done that in grade 10. Let me remind you that even before we get to the OGA, that's that means that we will have to get a representative for this group so we're going to take the middle number from 10 to 20 
And that represented if we're going to multiply by two, then we're going to get the middle number from 20 to, 20 to 30, and that number we're going to multiply by eight. Then we're going to take the, I call it the representative because it's a group, you see? So from 30 to 40, who's exactly in the middle? You know, can you see? From 30 to 40, who's exactly in the middle? And multiply that by five. And then eventually we're going to decide, no, not decide, we're going to divide. What are we going to divide by? Well, we'll have to add all these things and then divide and then it's going to be rounded to two decimals. Let's see if they show that. I hope not, because I want you to do that. Ah, they're starting to show you. See, we have to get the middle number. And lots of people do it like that. From 10 to 20, so you can simply divide by 2. So 15 is in the middle. So that's going to be 15 times 2, which is going to give you 30, which is why many people, or most people, draw in an extra column there. 30. Then we're going to say 20 plus 30, that's, you know, divided by 2, 25 times 8, and then 30 plus 40, that's 70 divided by 2 times 5, and so on. So we're going to do all of them like that. Let me just run through that quickly. Can you see there's all of them? Now, we have to multiply them also. We have to go 15 times 2, 25 times 8, 35 times 5, you know, 45 times 10, sorry about this, but I have to go through it, 55 times 12, 65 times 18, 75 times 3, and 85 times 2, and hopefully, if you didn't make a mistake, you will get 3080. Then, what do you divide by? So, a lot of grade 12s get this wrong. A lot of grade 12s go like this. They go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and then divide by 8. But we can't do that because you must count all the days. Can you see two days, eight days, you know, 10, 5, add them all up 60. And then it says that you must now round off to two decimals. Um, I see this question a lot, you know, and I've been teaching for a long, long time. Whenever they say estimate the mean or they say get the approximate mean, that is what they want. So get the middle number. Multiply it by that frequency, get the new answer, add, add, and divide. Okay? So, of course, eventually they're going to go to the ogive and so on, but that's always the first, first thing that they ask. Always the first thing. Is a repeat of that? I don't know why it's a repeat, so I'll just run through that again. Oh, that's for the Afrikaans. Now they go, let's draw a frequency graph, a cumulative, not a frequency graph, a cumulative frequency graph. That's called the OGIF of the data. Guaranteed question. Can you see that in this year, the Department of Education who set the question paper was kind. They gave you the grid, so you don't have to spend time on that. They gave you the label there, and they gave you the label there at the bottom. So we just have to sketch this thing. But now, can you remember where to make the dot? Because the two, what do we do with that? What does cumulative mean again? Can you remember? Ah, there's a column missing. We must get the cumulative frequency. That means we must add them all to each other to get the growing frequency. Cumulative means it's a frequency that's growing, growing, growing. Can you see? There it comes now. So the first one is just 2. So the next one is going to be 2 plus 8. Yeah. So then the next one is going to be 2 plus 8 plus 5. And so on and so on and so on. So we add all of them. Now, since we want to plot these points, it's a good idea to have like coordinates. So where does the 2 now go? Where does the 10 go? Well, the label says that the cumulative frequency must go on the vertical. That means the 2 and the 10 and the 15 and the 25, they all go on this side. 
But what goes on the left hand side? Can you remember that? Do you use the 10? Do you use the 20? You can't guess. You have to know that. Then for the second one, do you going to are you going to plot 20 with the 10 or are you going to plot 30 with the 10? Can you remember? The people who came up with the OJIVE has decided, we can't argue with them, that it will always be the number on the right-hand side. It will always be the number on the right-hand side. So the first coordinate that we will go plot will be 20 semicolon 2. Like that. So then the next one will be the number on the right, so that will be 30 and then 10. See there we plot it? Now can you see already it's an approximation? Because where is 2? You know 2 is there somewhere, you can read it off actually, 2, 20. So now the next one will be 30 and 10. So 30 and 10, so the next dot's going to go over there. Yep. Then the next one's going to be 40 and 15. So where's 40? There's 40. And there's 15. It's not looking bad at all. And so we complete all these coordinates. And then we must go complete all of them. Now, can you see? It has to form that S kind of shape. So please don't make the mistake of using a ruler, especially those of you that are very neat. You can't go with a ruler and go straight, straight, straight. This is actually freehand. So you have to go and just connect all those dots right up to there. And it has to have this S shape. So we have to do it like that. Okay. Now, what happened over there? Now, the people who came up with the idea of the Ogai decided that you must anchor this thing, which means that the previous one, which is now fictitious, fictional, is not really there. You know, if this is, look here on the table, if this is 50, no, 40, and if that is 30, and that is 20, then the previous one, of course, would have been 10. 10. And the frequency to that one would be zero, because there is nothing. So you have to anchor this thing. So now you go from this anchor point, and then freehand, you draw this whole thing. And don't try to make it straight. Make it an S. Yep. I don't even like that so much because it looks like straight line, straight line, but I guess it's okay. I'm sure if you have it like that in the final exams, you will get full marks for that. Yep. It says hence, which means now estimate. That can't be an exact answer. Can you see? Estimate the number of days on which 65 or more messages were sent. Okay. The number of days on which 65 or more. So 65 or above. So let's see. This is 50 messages. This is 60 messages. Are you watching this little red dot? So 65 is going to be in the middle here. So let's see if I can go up here, 65, up, 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 until I reach the graph. Hopefully I'm still in the middle, 65. Then I must go over to the left, over to the left, over to the left, over to the left. And now I must estimate that. So can you see why the memo can't have an exact answer? The memo must now probably have something like anything from 41 to 44 or from 42 to 43 or something like that, you know, an estimation of that. So maybe can you just try that quickly, see if you can get that 65 in the middle, where is 65 in the middle, am I still in the middle, going over in the middle, thereabouts. Where's 65, up, 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 until you reach the graph. To the left, to the left, to the left. Sure. So according to this dotted line, I was bad. So 65 in the middle, in the middle, in the middle. Oh, I lost my way. Can you see? 
I went there, but it's actually up higher and then to the left. And then they say it's 46, but the member will never give 46. It will say 45 to 47 or anything like that, and you will get your mark for that. The number of days on which 65 or more messages were sent. Yeah. So why do they say 40? Because we haven't answered the question yet. The number of days, so on how many days, are you listening? On how many days did they send 65 or more messages? So it's from here to the last one. So from day 46 to day 60. From day 46 to day 60. That's how many days. Well, there's the nice O drive, or the O drive, sorry, pronunciation bad. It looks like that. This formula does not give you quartile one. This formula does not give you quartile two. And this formula does not give you quartile three. Now, the reason we, why I'm talking in such an earnest and serious way is because I have said this in my own classes so, so many times, and then still the learners make this mistake. These formulas give you the position of the quartile. It gives you the placement. It tells you where on this graph the quartiles might be found. So I'm just going to make something up. So let's say you use the formula now, and the first number, let's say, this now gives you six, for example. And let's say you use the formula. Uh, it can also be a, a, you know, a kind of a fraction thing. That's okay, because we are not working with accurate numbers. We're working with approximations. So let's say this one is 17. And let's say the last one is 29. I'm just making up numbers randomly as I go. I'm just picking them from the sky. So then, these are not the quartiles. So what I have found over the years is that when the question goes, determine quartile one, you know, or determine quartile two, or determine quartile three, then grade 12, in grade 12 and grade 11, of course, would then write down that quartile one is six, or write down that quartile two is 17. But it's not, you see. That's the position. So this is what you need to do. So on the vertical line you find six let's say that's now six and we say that's quartile one but that's not quartile one that's the position i'll show you now and let's say then you find 17 and we say quartile two and then we find 29 which is somewhere there and we say quartile three now, if you stop there, you're not going to get the marks because those are not the quartiles themselves. Those are the positions. So now you have to go across to your graph and then go down. And then with the 17, you go across to your graph and then you go down. I'm going to go slowly now because people make a lot of mistakes with this. And then with the 29, you go across to the graph and then you go down. And now can you see, because the graphs are not accurate, these numbers that you find down here, whatever they are. So I'm just going to make up something, eh? So this is not accurate, but let's say you go down here and you say this is now, I don't know what, anything. Let's say 19, and let's say that's, I don't know, 50, and let's say that's 91 or whatever. Now, because you, some of you might have a bad handwriting like me, can you see it? Terrible handwriting. Because some of you might have handwriting like that. Because some of you might be wobbly when you go across and down. And for many reasons. And also because your graph could be a little bit wobbly. So I must now say that quarter one is in 19 and quarter two is 50 and quarter three is 91. Now, one person might have a 19 over here, 
you know, one person might have an 18 over there, one person might have a 21 or a 22 over there. And that's why the, the memo doesn't just give one answer there, but gives a range. Memo might say from 17 to 20 award the mark. You know, or from 48 to 52 or whatever, award the mark. So it's very important. So these up here, these are not the core tiles. They are the positions. Here are the core tiles. So that is core tile one. Must be read off on the horizontal line. But the positions of the core tiles are to be found on the vertical line. And as I said, many, many great trolls make terrible mistakes over there. So this is the histogram which you did in primary school for the very first time. Can you also see this is groups data. This is not about, let's say, the marks of a single learner. You know, let's say there is a learner called Gracious, and, and these are not the marks of one learner. Can you see these are groups? That's why we call that group data. So for some reason, there's this part of the road where they are checking the speed of the cars as they pass there. So they're checking 55 cars to see how fast they go. And on this one, you see the, how many cars. And there you see the speeds. And that's now in kilometers per hour, you know, sort of from 20 to 30 or 30 to 40 or so on. Um, and then... I remember this question because somewhere along the line, a lot of my grade 11s and 12s missed this little part. Can you see there? This is speed limit, which probably means that there's going to come a question later on on how many people are going to be getting speed tickets. You know, if there's like a camera or there's a speed cop hiding behind the bushes because they are breaking um, the speed limit. But first, for one mark, the modal class. I don't know if you remember from grade 7 and 8 and 9 and so on. Mode was most. So modal is still the mode, the most. So which one is the most? It's the one that goes up to 17. So, of course, that's going to be the 50 to 61. So you can write it any way you like. You can use these nice little inequality signs if you want to. What I have found over the years is that most people just use normal um, English. They would say 50 to 60. Yeah. Okay, now, can you see it's now leading us towards doing a, an ogive? Because the moment they say cumulative, they're talking about the growing frequency and they are asking us to complete this table. So what we will have to do, if you can follow this little red dot, we will have to put in all the normal frequencies that we can see on this histogram from there. You know, the 1, the 7, the 13, and so on. And then we will have to make them grow the way we did when we started on Wednesday. So we will keep on adding, 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 and make it grow. So there we get the normal frequencies from the histogram. And always make sure that you just write it incorrectly. So now we can just start. Can you remember that? So one is just one. Then we go one and seven. So that's eight. Can you see? And then one and seven and 13. It's 21. There are many ways of doing this. But this is what it comes down to. And then it's one and seven and 13 and 17. Then it's 38 and so on and so on and so on. So now we have the normal frequencies as they are shown on this graph. And we have the cumulative, the growing, the increasing frequency. That's what cumulative really means. It means we're gathering, we're growing, we're increasing. It's becoming more and more as we keep on adding to the previous one. So we keep on adding the previous one, the previous one, the previous one. And there we have it. And now it's going to say draw a cumulative frequency graph which you must know that it's another name for the ogive. Now, I said on Wednesday, we need to know the following. So I'm just going to repeat this. If the question paper is kind, they will give you a grid and they will have the labels on them. The vertical label 
and the horizontal label. If they don't have the labels on them, we must write down the labels or we will lose one or two marks there. Also, the O guy cannot be drawn with a ruler because it's an S shape. If you plot your points and you find that the graph is not an S shape, well, roughly an S shape, then you know that there is a mistake somewhere and you can just go and check that. So, freehand sketch. So, this is what we did on Wednesday. We said we have to find points to plot and we use the last number of the class. That's what was decided by everybody in the world. So the 30 and the 1. See, there's the first coordinate pair. Then the 40 and the 8. The 50 and the 21 and so on. So there we write down all the coordinates of them. So now we have to go and plot them, which we now do. We plot them. Let's just check quickly. Look with me. 30 and 1. Can you see now why I said these graphs are not accurate? Because it's tough to see where 1 is. Can you see there's 30. Now where's 1? Is it there? Is it there? Is it there? Where's 1? So it's more or less there. The next one is 40 and 8. So we go 40 and 8. That one is more clear. And so we must plot all of them. So one thing for which you will get marks is if you have plotted all these points, not just some of them, but all these points correctly. The second thing that the um, person marking your work in November, December will be looking for, as I said before, does this form the well-known S shape? And freehand, no ruler there, no ruler there, freehand. Then look here, there are the, the labels, we must have them. And then you must now anchor the thing because 30 and 1 is in the air. So if you go here, this is 30, 40, 50. So what would the previous one be just before the 30? That would be 20, which is not there. So that's just in your head, you know, fictional, invisible kind of thing. Would be 20, and it doesn't have a frequency. So it would be 20 and 0. 20 and 0, and so we anchor that. If you show it like this, now not the dotted line yet. I'm just talking about the graph itself, the labels, the correct plotting, all the dots there, where they should be. The person marking your work in November, December is going to check these dots one by one, and then also the anchor to the previous invisible, fictional, in your mind class, which has a, a frequency of zero. Okay, can you see there it says now the 20 fictional one, zero. is asking for the modal class. Remember the previous one, we said the modal class. What was the modal class again? Can we maybe just go back? Because it was 17, can you see there? 17. And now where would we find this over here? We said it was from 50 to 60. I just need to go back and make sure that we get that correct. Uh -uh, it's not the one I want to show you. The previous one was that. The model class. The model class was the one between 50 and 60. It's actually between 50 and 60 there. Yeah. Between 50 and 60. That's why it's pointing there. Now comes the, the part about the 
people going to check the who broke the, the law, who went too fast. The traffic department sends speeding fines to all motorists whose speed exceeds 66 kilometers per hour. Now it says estimate the number of motorists. You understand why they say estimate? Because as I said before, and I think I'm going to stop saying that now, is that this graph is not accurate. And so you can't read off an accurate answer. But let's see, exceeds means more than. So let's say 66 is more or less there. So up, 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 down to that side. So you can't read that off really, but you can estimate, guess, approximate what that is. So I don't know, let's say it's 44, 45-ish in the middle, 44. That's how, what you will do, you will guess. You will say it's probably, you know, 44, something like that. But is 44 now the answer? It can't be. Because they're not asking, um, they're not saying that speeding fines will, do, will be sent to people who do 66 kilometers per hour. It will say people that do more than 66. So we will have to get this number, 44, and then we will have to get the, the highest one over there and find that. See, and then from here to there, that will tell us how many people are getting um, speeding fines. So it's always a language thing. That's one of the things that make mathematics difficult for lots of people. It's the language thing and the, all the reading. If they say how many people, estimate how many people will get a speeding fine because they are doing 66 kilometers per hour, then we go 66 and we guess, we estimate, we approximate probably 44. But now it's more than 66. So it's from here to whatever that is, we will have to guess what that is. There's 66, oh, it is 44. Anyway, that's what they're guessing as well. You know, it could, could be 43, depending on what your graph looks like. But if you say 43, you will still get your mark, or 45. And then we will have to check what that one is. So we go over, 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 and we say it's 55 or 54 even, doesn't matter, you will get your, your mark there. And then we go, okay, so from there to there, how many people? So we we'll have to go decide from this one to that one, how many people would that be? Is it 50? No, it's not 50. That's the 50 over there. So don't look at that. You have to go from there to there. 55 minus 44, so it's 11. Can you see this little sign, which means approximate? So look here, this is what the memo actually said in 2014. If you said 10, you would get the mark. If you said 11, you would get the mark. If you said 12, you would get the mark. Because it could have been 43, you know, it could have been 45 there. And then the same with that one. Okay, so now it comes down to that failure question that I was talking about earlier, uh, where you guys said it was blurry. But now let's just think, what is median again? What is another word for median? It's a number in the middle. So another, oh, another name for median, is it not Q2? Uh-huh. So what is, what is that? Well, we need to know what N is. So sometimes they give us in, you know, in the question just before this, they said 55 cars are being checked. So we knew that N was 55. In this question, which is now November 2011, the grid was given. So we don't sketch it, the grid is given, and now they're asking us questions on that. So we have to go find out, first of all, what is N. So this was the last one and the highest one. So we go across, 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 City. If they say quarter one, then we would go a quarter of that. Median, that's quarter two, that's a half. And of course, quarter three, that's 
three quarters. Now you can use 30 if you use the formula half n, or you can use 31 if you use the formula half and then brackets n plus one. So if this um, is now using the n, just the n, so let's see, the, so that's 15 of, of course. That means if you're now writing down that the median is 15, then it means you're making the mistake that so many of my learners have made over the years. That is not the median. That is the position of the median. So you have to go from the 15 over, 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 over to until you reach the graph. And then you have to go down, down, down. Like it's showing you now. Now, can you see? I mean, who knows what that number is? This is six. That's seven. That's eight. That's nine. That's almost seven. So, I mean, who knows what that is? So that's going to be close to seven. So, which is why your answer cannot be an exact answer. It says 6,9, but that's a guess. I mean, it could have been 6,95, you know, or it could have been 6,8. But that's fine. That's how the memo marks it. What is interquartile range again? When this question, when this session started, right in the beginning, it said, or it gave you some formulas, and it said that you need to remember those formulas. Now, I don't have this two-way communication with you, so I can't ask you to answer me the question, but there where you are, in your school, or at your home, wherever you are, just in your head, are you able to write down what the interquartile range is? You know, in, without looking it up? It's Q3 minus Q1. So that means we must get Q3, which is why they're using three quarters now. So that's the position more or less. So you'll have to go over, 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 over until you go there, and then you have to go down again like we did just now. And it's going to be, I know there's no such a word really, but it's a guesstimate, you know, guess and estimate, it's a guesstimate. So we're going to sort of guess what that is, approximate. Uh, 8, 5, um, 6, 7, 8, 7, See, I'm not even sure if that is 8,5. To me, it doesn't look like it's in the middle. So if you said 8,4, it would have been perfect, or 8,5, or 8,6, something like that. So there we have Q3. Now we have to do Q1. 7,5, remember, is not the answer. So what is 7,5? That's the position, that's where it is. So how do we read off 7,5 here? 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Okay, so 5, 6, 7 and a half. So it's more or less there. Then we have to go across until we reach the graph. Then we have to go down and then we have to guesstimate. Estimate, guess. Let's see if I can guess this before they do it. So I think it's 3, 4, five, six, so between four and five, but it doesn't look like it's in the middle. Um, it's probably going to say 4,5, but if I had to do it, I probably would have said 4,6. They say 4,5, well, I'm happy with that. I would, if I, if I was writing the paper, I would have probably said 4,6, which is why if you say 4,6, you would get full marks for that. So there you have Q1. And there you have Q3. And so the interquartile range, you now have to subtract the two. Look at this one now. So the OGIF is given. And it says complete the frequency table. So we will have to put in all these things. That means we will have to get all these groups over here. Get the frequencies over here, the cumulative frequencies, you know, the growing frequencies, and then the coordinates. Where would one start now? Where would one start? Hmm. 
zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. Let's always make sure we understand how these numbers work, because it goes from six to nine, so we go six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, and so on. So from one to three, that's the first one. Now we can just put them all in. So I'm not going to waste your time on that. There we put them all in. So there we have all the groups. It has been decided that this gets the equal sign, that doesn't get the equal sign. One day when you're at university and you might decide to study stats, which is a huge branch of mathematics on its own, then you can go and delve deeper into why the equal sign is on this side and not on that side. For us now, it's not important. So there we have the groups. What now? What is that frequency? Zero, is it not? Let's see what happens now. Three. Is that three, three? What is this person doing now? The person that's doing this um, the slide for you, not me. The person who prepared this whole thing. Why not? Why they're not starting over on this side? Because you can't. You don't have the frequencies on this thing, you see. You have the growing frequencies. So on all the previous questions, we had the frequencies, and then we completed the fre the, the cumulative, the growing frequencies from that. And now it's the other way around. So let's start by writing down all the coordinates of the points. So that's 3, 3. What's the following one going to be? 5, 9, yeah, and so we write in all of them. So these ones are the numbers, of course, now that are on this horizontal line. So these numbers, what are they? They're not the frequencies, they're the growing frequencies, they're the cumulative frequencies. The three, can you see? And the nine, they are the growing frequencies. So we're working in reverse now. So now we must think backwards. In all the previous questions, we had these ones. So we, we would say the first one, three, is just three. Then we would add to get the next one. Then we would add all of them to get the next one, and so on and so on. But now we have to work in reverse. The first one is always easy because three is just three. What's that going to be now? Three and what is nine? Three and what is nine? Yes, six. So what, see, can you see we're working in reverse now? So what do we add to the nine to get the 16? Seven. What do we add to the 16 to get the 24? Yeah, see, we're working all in reverse. Now, this question I haven't seen very often, but it's good that you're looking at this because if a question like that comes up and you don't have the experience on it, and because you might be stressed a little bit and you can see the time moving, you might not know where to start. So can you see that when these things are left open and you only have the graph, that you start on that side, so you work in reverse. In all the questions, all the other questions, we put in the frequencies first. After that, we did the cumulative frequencies after that. After that, we wrote down the coordinates. Then we plotted all the coordinates, boom, 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 boom. And then by freehand, we joined all of them. So if everything is open, then we will have to work in reverse. So what was last now becomes first. So you get all the coordinates from that, you write them down. Then, of course, these ones are the cumulative frequencies. The first one is always what it is. So if that's a seven, then that's a seven. If this is a 2, then that's a, that's a 2. And then instead of adding this way now, you're thinking backwards now. So you're going 
3 and 1. So it gave us 9, so 6. And what gives us 16? 7. And what gives us 24? 8. And so on and so on and so on. And there we have completed the whole thing. Okay, so now we're getting to, to your turn. Let's just check this thing out. So the photos that come through, through people have 19. So this is a tough question. Um, can you see because you have two unknowns, you had to make two equations. So you had to make one equation and another equation, and then simultaneously, and you had to solve all of them. But if you were not able to, to get those five marks, that's fine. You can now use the 24 and the 16, and then also the questions that come after that. There's the model class. Everybody should be able to get that. That's the most. Let's look at the graph. Let's see how the marks are given. There. See? Labels. Labels must be there. Smooth shape. Not as using a ruler, you know. It must be the air shape and all of that. So it's normally four marks. And these marks are not always the same. It's normally, uh, I say normally because whoever sets the paper for the end of the year, or whoever set the paper, because it's already set, of course, um, can decide what the marks are going for. But it's normally for the labels, if the labels are not given, if the labels are given, like in this case, then it can't be for that. Then for the shape and for the grounding over there, like I've shown you, and so on and so on and so on. How many people? Well, you have to go back to the one about the speeding fines. If you don't understand that, remember we said because we are working on a graph which is not perfect, the answer can't just be one answer. So it could be anything there. Can you see there from this to that, from this to that? So if you just write the answer right down, which is always very dangerous to do, hopefully your teachers told you that from grade eight. If the question counts more than one mark, don't just write the answer unless there's nothing else to do, unless it's a question where it's just right or wrong. But in most cases, show, because you might still get one out of two or, you know, one out of four or whatever the thing counts. If you wrote the answer only and it's correct, you get the two marks. If you wrote the answer only and it's wrong, you get no marks. So there's the memo, guys. You can just check that quickly. So all the all the questions are very normal questions. You can see that. The only tough one was the grade 10 question, really. The 75th percentile. If you can't remember how to do that, but please ask your teacher to explain that again. What is the 75th percentile? Or see if you can find the grade 10 textbook, maybe. Um, and then these 1.1.6, these are the questions that you see um, so, so many times. If they ask for the interquartile range, remember that you must give quartile 3, quartile 1, and then subtract them. Once again, it says there on the memo, answer only full marks, but it's always so dangerous to do that. So rather show all the steps. Say quartile 3 is, and then say quartile 1 is, and then subtract them, you know, and can you see there that anything from 13 to 17 would give you the marks, and anything from 21 to 23, because these things can't be, cannot be accurate, absolutely can't be accurate. Formulas we need to know from grade 11 will appear on our formula sheet. They are not named, so we need to know which formula is for what. The first one is our distance formula, then we have our midpoint formula, our gradient formula, please remember for the gradient formula, if they talk about perpendicular lines, the gradient of the first line times the gradient of the second line must give me negative one. 
And if they talk about parallel lines, the gradient of the first line is equal to the gradient of the second line. We also have our inclination angle formula on the formula sheet, where tan of theta is equal to the gradient. Do remember to look at your sketch, whether theta is an acute angle or an obtuse angle. We work from the right-hand side of the x-axis from the zero, so our inclination angle is always from the right-hand side. It can either be an acute angle or an obtuse angle. So let's go look at some past papers in November 2021. They said, they gave us this question. They said, in the diagram, A is the coordinate negative 2, 10, B is the coordinate K, K, and C is 4, negative 2 are the vertices of triangle ABC. Line BC is produced to H and cuts the x-axis at E, which is the coordinate 12, 0. AB and AC intersect the x-axis at F and G, respectively. The angle of inclination of line AB is 81,87. So quite a bit of information. Please ensure you do read through the information before you start. So our first question, question 3.1. They ask me to calculate the gradient of line BE. So line BE runs from there to there. Remember, you can use any two coordinates on line BE to calculate the gradient. So I can use C and E to calculate the gradient, and I can use my gradient formula. So M equals Y2 minus Y1 divided by X2 minus X1. And what I always do is I write down on the side for myself, I'm going to use coordinate C, which is 4 and negative 2, and E, who is coordinate 12 and 0. Remember, it does not matter which one you use as the first coordinate or the second one, just as long as you stick to what you're doing. So if I'm going to go from Y from my second coordinate would have been 0, minus Y from my first coordinate would be negative 2. Please do not forget to substitute in a bracket. X from my second coordinate is 12, minus X by my first coordinate is 4. A negative and a negative makes a positive, so that's 2 over 12 minus 4 is 8, so my gradient is a quarter. If I look at that, that was two marks, so where's the two marks? It's a mark for the substitution and a mark for the answer. Question 3.1.2. Determine, sorry, Calculate the gradient of line AB. So now I'm going to go look at line AB. I have coordinate A. I do not have coordinate B. There's no other coordinate on the graph on that line specifically. But I do have the inclination angle. So I'm going to use my inclination angle formula. So tan of theta will be equal to my gradient. I have my inclination angle. So tan of 81,87 will give me my gradient. So on your calculator, you're going to go press tan of 81.87, and I get my gradient is 7. So the gradient of line AB is equal to 7. Once again, two marks, a mark for the substitution and a mark for the answer. Question 3.2. In question 3.2, they're asking me to determine the equation of line BE in the form y equals mx plus c. So they want the equation of the straight line. Please go look back at what they've made us calculate already. They've already asked me in the first question to get the gradient of that line. We calculated the gradient was a quarter. So I already know the gradient. So y is equal to a quarter x plus c. Do I have a coordinate I can substitute in to get the value of c? Yes, I've got two coordinates I can pick up from. I can either do 4, negative 2 or 12, 0. It's my choice. I'm going to go with 4, negative 2. So negative 2 equals a quarter times 4 plus c. If I multiply out, that gives me 1. So c works out to be negative 2. Three. Please remember to finish your answer off by saying that means y is equal to a quarter x minus 
three. Once again, two marks. So where did the two marks go? For substituting in a coordinate and then for getting the final equation. Question 3.3. They ask us to calculate the first one, the, co the coordinates of B, where K is smaller than zero. So now I must get the coordinates of B. There is two ways I can do this. I can either use the gradient formula because I do know what the gradient is, or I can just substitute this coordinate into the equation of the line BE. I'm going to go with the second option because that's our easiest one. We know the equation of the line BE y is equal to a quarter x minus 3, so I'm going to go substitute in kk. So k is equal to a quarter k minus 3. So if I start solving this, I will get negative 3 quarters k is equal to negative 3. If I divide both sides by negative 3, k works out to be negative 4. So B is the coordinate, negative 4, negative 4. Check if you are correct. Is B supposed to be negative coordinates? Yes, it is. So where do the marks go? This was also just a two-mark question. It is a mark for the substitution and a mark for getting to the final answer that B is negative 4 and negative 4. Question 3.3.2. For question 3.3.2, they're asking me to calculate the size of angle A. Whenever I need an angle on a picture that has not got to do with an inclination angle, go and work out the inclination angle of the two lines that form that angle. So angle A is formed by line AB and line AC. If I can get both inclination angles, then I can use my grade 8 geometry to calculate angle A. I already have the inclination angle of line AB, so I do need the inclination angle of line AC. To get that inclination angle, I first need to know what's the gradient of line AC. So the gradient of line AC, y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. I'm going to use the coordinate A, which is negative 2, 10, and C, the coordinate 4, negative 2. If I substitute in, for me, my second y coordinate was negative 2, minus my first y coordinate is 10. My second x coordinate is 4, minus my first x coordinate is a negative, so I remember my brackets, negative 2. If I simplify that, it, my gradient works out to be negative 2. I've calculated my gradient. I want my inclination angle. So tan of my inclination angle is equal to my gradient. So tan of theta will be equal to negative 2. Grade 12s, please remember, when we do trick, we're not going to type in the negative when we do our work out our reference angle. So my reference angle, I'm going to go OK. Second function, tan of 2. Remember the second function, we're getting angle. And I get the reference angle is 63,4349. Not rounding off yet, 63,4349. That was negative. That helps me determine in which quadrants am I going to be. Where is tan negative? In my second and in my fourth quadrant. So with this picture, what would that refer to? This would refer to the second quadrant. So to get to the second quadrant, theta would be 180 minus 63,4349. So my theta would be 116,57. Okay, now I'm going to go fill that in on my sketch. 116,57. So how can I now get angle A? I can use exterior angle of a triangle. If I add up the two inside angles, I'll get the outside. So I can use that to calculate angle A. So angle A 
will be 116,57 minus my 81,87. I've used exterior angle of a triangle, good old grade 8 geometry, and that worked out to be 34,70. So where did they allocate the marks? And you will see this was now a four mark question. So where are our four marks going? The first mark is for calculating the gradient of AC. Then we have a mark for knowing that you're going to use inclination angle and put tan theta equals to negative 2. A mark for calculating what is theta. And then our final mark for working out angle A with the reason. Please remember to include your reason as well. Do not leave out the reason. Questions 3.3.3. They ask us the coordinate of point of the points of intersection of the diagonals of a parallelogram ACES, where S is a point in the first quadrant. Now, what do I need to remember about the diagonals of a parallelogram? First of all, they're talking about a parallelogram that's not on our picture. ACES. So S is somewhere here. We don't know. But what do you know about the, the diagonals of a parallelogram? They intersect in the middle. So I can just go and work out the midpoint of line AE because that would be my one diagonal. So I'm going to go work out the midpoint of line AE. So I need my midpoint formula. x1 plus x2 over 2, y1 plus y2 over 2. And I'm using coordinate A, which is negative 2, 10, and coordinate E, which is 12, Zero. So let's go substitute in. Negative 2 plus 12 divided by 2 and 10 plus 0 divided by 2. And it works out that the midpoint is 5, 5. Marks allocated on this question, once again, two marks, a mark for each of the coordinates, 5 and 5. If we go and look at November 2020, they give us the following. They say, triangle TSK is drawn. The equation of line ST is equal to a, y equals a half x plus 6, and ST cuts the x-axis at m. W, the coordinate negative 4, 4, lies on ST, and R lies on SK, such that WR is parallel to the y-axis. WK cuts the x-axis at V and the y-axis at the coordinate P, which is 0, negative 4. KS is produced, cuts the x-axis at N, and angle TSK is equal to theta. Okay, let's see what can we answer now. Our first question, 3.1. Calculate the gradient of W. P. Let's go look where is WP. W and P. Do I have the coordinates? Yes, so this is quite a simple one. I can just use the gradient formula. I always write down my coordinates for myself down next to it. So W is negative 4, 4 and P is 0, negative 4 and I can go and substitute in. So this will be negative 4 minus 4 over 0 minus, remember, if you're subbing in a negative, please use a bracket, negative 4. And my gradient works out to be negative 2. Two marks, a mark for the substitution and a mark for the answer. Question 3.2. They ask me to show that WP is perpendicular to line ST. What do we know about perpendicular lines? If I multiply their gradients, I should get negative 1. Do I have the gradient of WP? The gradient of WP we just calculated is negative 2. Do we have the gradient of line ST? Yes, we do. At the start, they told me the equation of line ST. Y is equal to a half X plus 6. So we know the gradient is a half. So now I've got to go multiply those gradients and hopefully get to an answer of negative 1. So the gradient of line WP 
times the gradient of line ST. Negative 2 times a half works out to be negative 1. So what does that mean? It means that WP is perpendicular to ST. So I have shown it. Where do the marks go? For the multiplication and for the getting to the negative one, please do not forget your conclusion. We need the conclusion there for you to get the final mark. Question 3.3. They ask us the following. They say, if the equation of SK is given as 5Y plus 2X plus 60 equals 0, calculate the coordinates of S. So they're not giving me the equation of line SK, and they're asking me the coordinates of S. Remember, what else have they given me? They've given me the equation of line ST, and I know S is on SK and on ST. So I can solve this with simultaneous equations. But let's take this equation of line SK, which they gave me as 5Y plus 2X plus 60 equals 0, and first go and write it in standard form. So that means 5Y equals negative 2X minus 60 if I divide by 5. Y equals negative 2 over 5X minus 12. What was the equation of line ST again? y equals a half x plus 6. Coordinate s is on line st and sk. So these are simultaneous equations. I know these equations are equal to each other. So I can go negative 2 over 5x minus 6 equals a half x plus 6. And now I'm back to a nice and easy grade 10 simultaneous equation to solve. That gives me negative 9 over 10x. equals, sorry, I made a mistake here when I rewrote this. This must be negative 12 plus 18. If I divide by negative 9 over 10, I get x is negative 20. Remember, they asked the coordinate. So you must have, I've got the x, so I still need the y. To determine the y, I can substitute it either into the equation of sk or st. That is my choice. So I'm going to go y equals, I'm going to use the equation they gave me just to be safe, a half times negative 20 plus 6, and y works out to be negative 4. So s is the equation, negative 20 and negative 4. Look on your sketch. Does this make sense? Is the x and the y value both negative there? Yes. This was a four, a four mark question. So a mark for putting the two equations equal to each other, then for calculating the x value, then for substituting in to get the y, and then for your final y value and coordinates. Question 3.4. So if you've worked out something, good practice is to write it in on your sketch. So s is now the coordinate negative 20, negative 4. So let's write that in. Question 3.4. Calculate the length of WR. What do we know about WR? WR is parallel to the y-axis, which means we know what the x-coordinate is by W. The x-coordinate must be negative 4. We do not know the y yet, so we need to figure out what is the y. But what do you know about coordinate R? It is on line S, K. And we have the equation of line SK. So we can calculate the value of Y. We just worked out that line SK's equation and they gave it to me. But in standard form, it was Y equals negative 2 over 5X minus 12. So if I go substituting X is negative 4, what does my Y value work out to be? And my Y calculates to be negative 10, 4. So I now know this is the coordinate negative 4, negative 10, 4. They're asking me the length of WR. There's two ways I can do it. I can either see it from the sketch. Because this is a parallel line to the y-axis, I know this is perpendicular on the x-axis. So I can see that is 4. 
and that is 10 comma 4. So WR in total must be equal to 14 comma 4 units. If I'm struggling to see it, I can go calculate it with the distance formula. So I can also go say WR equals x by my second coordinate minus x from my first squared plus y from my second minus y from my first squared and I can use coordinate w and coordinate r. So if I use my distance formula and I substitute it in, I can go negative 4 minus, remember it's a negative again in a bracket, squared plus negative 10 comma 4 minus 4 squared and get the same answer of 14 comma 4 units. Okay, this was also a four mark question. So where did the four marks go? It was a mark for substituting in negative 4 into SK's equation and then a mark for calculating the negative 10, 4 of Y. Then if you just read it off by seeing it, you would have gotten both marks there. Otherwise, you would have gotten, received a mark for substituting into the distance formula and a mark for receive, getting to the final answer. Question 3.5. They're asking us calculate the size of theta. So now I've got to get that angle. Is it on the x-axis? No. So I can use the two lines that form that angle to help me. So if I go and calculate the inclination angle of the two lines that form that angle, I will be able to use my grade 8 geometry to get that. Okay, let's start with this one. Can I calculate the size of beta? It's on line SK. Do I have the gradient of that? Let's go see. So tan of beta will be equal to the gradient of line SK. We have the gradient of line SK. We calculated it as negative 2,5. Please remember, when you go and work out your reference angle, you do not type in the negative. So if I go shift tan, of 2 over 5, because I'm looking for an angle, I get 158. Okay, let's go do that quickly. Shift tan of 2 over 5. I get a reference angle of 21, 21,8014. Negative. In which quadrants is tan negative? The second and in the fourth. I will be in the second year. So beta, how do I get to the second? 180 minus my reference angle. Please do not round off in the middle of a sum. And we get that beta is 158,1985. So if I've worked out something, I'm going to fill it in. 158,1985. The moment I have gotten angle beta, I can immediately go get angle M, N, S with angles on a straight line. So I'm going to do that. Angle M, N, S works out to be 21,80 degrees with angles on a straight line. And I'm going to fill it in. 21,80. So I'm now done with line SK. The other line that forms this angle is line MT, ST. Do I have the gradient of line ST? Yes. So I can get that inclination angle. So let's go call it tan of what will we call this angle? I'm going to go call it angle TMV. Angle T. MV is equal to the gradient of line ST. So tan of angle TMV is equal to my gradient is a half. So angle TMV, if I go onto my calculator, works out to be 26,565. Let's go fill that in. 26,565. From there, I can go vertically opposite. So that's angle NMS. So angle NMS 
is 26,565, vertically opposite angles are equal. Let's go fill it in, 26,565. And now I can get theta with using the exterior angle of a triangle. If I add up the two inside angles, I'll get the outside. So my final step, theta is equal to 21,80 plus 26,565. I'm going to round my final answer off to two decimal places. That's 48,37, and it's the exterior angle of a triangle. Let's go see where the marks were allocated. This was a five-mark sum. So it was a mark for the first one for saying tan of beta is equal to the gradient of negative 2 over 5. Then a mark for calculating the size of beta. Then we have a mark for the tan of angle T and V equals a half. And the size of angle NMS with the reason showing your method. And then the final mark getting your angle theta with the reason of exterior angle of a triangle. When we are looking at our circle theorems, there are the 10 circle theorems from grade 11 that we must know. So if we go through them quick, the first one that says that if AC is equal to CB, then our reason is the line from the center is perpendicular to the chord. And if angle C is 90 degrees, the line from the center will be to the midpoint of the chord. That is our first theorem. Our second one is that the angle at the center of a circle is two times to the angle at the circumference, which means if I have a center of a circle, like angle BOC, if that is 2x, that angle BAC will be x. Please make sure you know all four versions of this one, where your angle at your center is twice the size of the angle on your circumference. Our third theorem we're looking at is that the angles in a semicircle is 90 degrees. So if I have BOC as my diameter, the angle that's formed on the circumference will be a 90 degree angle. Our next two theorems we're looking at has got to do with angles in segments. If we have angles in the same segment, they are equal. So angle A will be equal to angle B because they're on the same segment. They both originate from CD. And angle C will be equal to angle D. They're in the same segment. They both originate from AB. Same we can say if our chords are equal. If CD, the chord CD, is the same length as the chord EF. If the chords are equal, the angles on the circumference will be equal. Grade 12 is very important. We're talking about angles on circumference. So you have to make sure the angle is on the circumference. Then if we look at the ones with our cyclic quads, the opposite angles of a cyclic quad are supplementary. It means they add up to 180. So angle A and angle C together will give me 180. And angle B and angle D together will give me 180. Remember, for something to be a cyclic quad, all four corners of the cyclic quad has to be on the circumference. So A, B, C, and D are all four on the circumference. So that's a cyclic quad. We also had a theorem that the exterior angle of a cyclic quad is equal to the opposite inside one. So angle A will be the same size as angle C. Let's double check. Is A, B, C, D a cyclic quad? Are all four corners of the cyclic quad on the circumference of the circle? Yes. The next one we have has got to do with tangents. We had three that had to do with tangents. The first one was our tan chord theorem. The angle formed between a tangent and a chord, so if I look at this angle x, it will be equal to the angle on the opposite side of the chord on the circumference. So angle x will be the same as BAC, and then angle GCA, if I look at it from the other side, will be the same as angle ABC. That is our tan chord theorem. Then we also had that a tangent is always perpendicular to a radius. And lastly, that if we had tangents from the same point, they both originate from P, that they will be the same length. Those were my three tangent theorems. So let's go look at a paper from November 2021. Grade 12s, the 10 circle theorems you need to know out of your head as they do not appear anywhere for you and you need to know them. So November 2021 in question 9, they told me in the diagram, PQRS is a cyclic quadrilateral. 
P is, pr is produced to W. TR and TS are the tangents to the circle at R and S respectively. Angle T is 78 degrees, we can see that. And angle Q is 93 degrees, that is indicated to us. The first question, 9.1. Give a reason why ST is equal to TR. Remember they told me ST and TR are both tangents and they both originate from T. So that is one of our theorems. It's tangents from the same point. Tangents from the same point. So they just tested here if you know the theorem. That's it. And you will see it's one mark and it's one mark for the answer. 9.2.1 They ask us, calculate giving reasons. The first one they want is the size of angle S2. Now angle S2 is down here. Remember we just said these are tangents from the same point. So we know that ST is the same length as TR. So it helps if we indicate it. So what type of triangle is STR? It's an isosceles triangle which means angle S2 and angle R2 will be the same sides. So let's write that down. Angle S2 is equal to angle R2. And remember, very careful with this reason, it's angles opposite equal sides. Be careful with this reason, please. That's the only one we accept there. So if I now know these two are the same size, and this is a triangle, a triangle we know adds up to 180. So I can work out how big is angle S2. So angle S2, if that is 78, that leaves me with 102. And each of these have to be exactly the same size. Half of 102 is 51. So angle S2 is 51 degrees. And we use that the sum of the angles of a triangle. I have to add that reason as well. You will see this was two marks. You have to have the statement and the reason to get the first mark. The same with the second one. You have to have the answer and the reason to get the second one. So please remember to include your reasons. If there's no reason, we can't give a mark. Question 9.2.2. A very good tip, grade 12s. If you've worked out something, fill it in on your sketch. So I'm going to go fill in here 51 and 51. So I know it. Now they want the size of angle S3. Let's go see, where's S3? S3 is over there. What have they given me that I haven't used yet? Well, first of all, they told me PQRS is a cyclic quad. Very important. And they gave me angle Q is 93, which means automatically I know the exterior angle. So angle RSW will also be 93 because it's the exterior angle of a cyclic quad. And remember I said if we work out something, we fill it in. If the entire angle is 93 and I only want S3, I know that one is 51. I can just subtract them. So S3 is the 93 minus the 51 and that gives me 42. And for that, I don't need a reason because I've already proved that earlier. Two marks once again. A mark for the statement and the reason. And then a mark for the final answer. See how important it is that we know our 10 circle theorems? If we go on to November 2020, they've given me the following sketch and they've said, O is the center of the circle. Very important. KOM, KOM, bisects LN, so it cuts it in half, so I know those two are exactly the same length. I must think back to the first theorem. Angle M and O is 26 degrees. K and P are points of the circle, and angle NKP is 32 degrees. OP is drawn. My first question. Eight point one point one one A. Eight point one point one A. 
They ask me, determine giving reasons the size of angle O2. What is angle O2? Remember they said O is the center of the circle. So O2 is the angle at the center. Do I have an angle at the circumference? Yes. So immediately I know that one is double it. So angle O2 is double the 32. It's 64. Angle at center is equal to 2 times the angle at the circumference. Once again, you will see it's two marks. The marks go for the 64 and for the reason. Remember, if we worked out something, good practice, fill it in on your sketch, 64. B. They would like to know angle O3. So let's go see if we can get angle O3. O3 is over there. Why are they asking me angle O3? Well, first of all, yes, it is an angle at the center, but that's not going to help me. If I look in triangle MON, I must know what M2 is. Because we already know that KM bisects line LN. So I must know M2 is 90 degrees. So that's the first thing I'm going to write down. Angle M2 is equal to 90 degrees. And my reason is line from center... To midpoint of chord. And I already filled in the 90 for myself. Now it's very easy to get O3. I can use good old fashioned sum of the angles in a triangle. And that is very simple for, to get O3 then. So O3 is then 180 minus the 90 minus the 26, which gives me 90 minus 26, which is 64 degrees. So I can fill it in. That's also 64 degrees. And then I can get O1, which the question asks. So O1, I can then get with angles on a straight line, which I know is add up to 180, which means O1 must be 52 degrees. Angles on a straight line. Grade 12s, there was another way to do this. You could have gone that O1 is the exterior angle and you could have worked out the entire exterior angle first by saying the 90 plus the 26 gives you 116 and then subtracted the 64 and also received 52. So there was more than one way to get this answer. This question counted four marks. The first mark was for getting that M2 is 90 and then the reason and then our next one, see, I forgot my reason there. Very important. I had to put in my reason, the sum of the angles of a triangle. I would have lost the mark there. The next mark would have been for the statement and the reason and the statement and the reason. Very important that you please indicate how you get to your answers. 8.1.2. Let's move that up so we can see. Prove giving reasons why KN... YKN by 6 angle OKP. So we have to go calculate angle K2. So let's see, what do we have? Very important to know that KO and OP are radii, which means they are the same length. So let's go indicate that. Which also means that I know that angle OKP and OPK will be the same size. So let's go write that down. Angle O. KP will be the same size as angle OPK. Reason, remember, important this one, angles opposite equal sides. And good practice is just to write in that you know that KO and OP were the same because they are radii. It's always just good practice to write that in as well. So, how big are these angles then? Remember in the previous question, we worked out that O1 was 52 and we haven't filled it in yet. So let's fill it in 52. So if I know that those two angles have got to be the same size, triangle adds up to 180. So 180 minus 52 divided by 2, which means angle OKP will be 64 degrees 
the sum of the angles of a triangle. So the entire angle is 64. That put is 32, which means K2 must be 64 minus 32, and that's also then 32 degrees. So they're exactly the same size. So we can finish off by saying we know that means Kn by 6 angle OKP. That question counted three marks. Where did the three marks go? A mark for having that the two angles are equal because it's angles opposite equal side with the statement and the reason. Then it is a mark for the 64 and the sum of the angles in a triangle. Remember the reason as well. And then a final mark for getting to the 32 and your conclusion. If we go on to our next paper. Let's go look at the next paper. November 2019. They gave us this sketch. And they said the following. In the diagram, PQRS is a cyclic quad. RS is produced to T, K, K is a point on RS, and W is a point on the circle, such that QRKW, QRKW is a parallelogram, and they've indicated that for us. PS and QW intersect at U. Angle PST is 136 degrees. And angle Q1 is 100 degrees. Determine with reasons the size of the following. Our first question, 8.1.1. They're asking me the size of angle R. Angle R is over there. Remember they said that, that Q, R, K, W is a parallelogram. So we can get angle R very easily. Angle R is 80 degrees. Why? They are co-interior angles. Remember your reason? Co-interior angles and very important to add the parallel lines that QW is parallel to RK. Without the parallel lines, the reason is not complete. Two marks. A mark for answer and a mark for the reason. Very important, once again, if we've worked out something, let's fill it in on the sketch, 80 degrees. 8.1.2. Now they are looking for the size of angle P. Angle P is over there. P, Q, R, S was a cyclic quad. What do we know about the opposite angles of a cyclic quad? They are supplementary, they add up to 180. So angle P must be 100 degrees. Reason? Opposite angles of a cyclic quad. Once again, very simple, or 100, let's fill it in, and our two marks go for the answer and the reason. 8.1.3. They now want angle PQW. PQW. That angle over there. So let's see. What do we know? We know P, Q, R, S is a cyclic quad. They've given me the exterior angle of 136. So I know that this entire interior one, P, Q, R, must also be 136. So let's write that down. Angle P, Q, R must be 136. Exterior angle of cyclic quad. So if this entire angle is 136 and they are looking for PQW, I know that bit's 100, I know the entire thing is 136, that means that must be 36. So angle PQW will be the 136 minus the 100, which is just 36. And that was three marks. So a mark for the PQR equals 136 and the reason and then a mark for getting to the 36. The last one they want, 
8.1.4, they are looking for angle U2. Angle U2 is over here. So let's look at what we've gotten so far. We've gotten that's 100 and that's 36. PQU makes a triangle. Angle U2 is the exterior angle of the triangle. So back to grade 9. If I add up the two interior angles, I get the exterior. So we know U2 must be 136. So let's write that down. Angle U2 is 136. Why? Exterior angle of triangle. So grade 12, you will see the questions are quite simple if we write in as we calculate things. Two marks again, mark for the 136 and a mark for the reason. Let's see what they gave us in November 2018. This was our sketch for November 2018 and they said the following. PON is a diameter. PON is a diameter, so immediately you must start thinking of angles in a semicircle if they give you a diameter. At the circle with center O, TM is a tangent. Now I've got a tangent to the circle at M. ON, a point on the circle. R is another point on the circle, so that OR is parallel to PN. If they give you parallel lines, remember alternating corresponding and co-interior angles. NR and MN are drawn. Let angle M1 be 66 degrees. Our first question. Eight point one point one. They are looking for the size of angle P. How can I get angle P now? Remember angle P sitting over here? They gave me a tangent. There's my chord, so this is the angle on the circumference. So angle P will be 66 degrees. It's the tan chord theorem. And let's go fill in that 66 for us. Two marks. A mark for the 66 and a mark for the reason. 8.1.2. They are looking for angle N2. Remember they said PON is a diameter and M2 is the angle on the circumference, which means that is my angle in the semi-circle. So that angle must be 90. So angle N2 is 90. Angle in semi-circle. Once again, two marks. State answer and reason. 8.1.3. We are looking for angle N1, this one over here. MPN forms a triangle. We have 90, we have 64. So we can work out N1 with the sum of the angles of a triangle. So N1 works out to be 24. Why? The sum of the angles of a triangle. And do you see this one only counts one mark? Because it's a grade 8 reason, it's one mark for the answer and the reason. Very important. You must have the reason there. So let's fill in R24. 8.1.4. They are now looking for angle O2. O2 is at the center, but immediately I should notice my parallel lines. I've got that 66, which means I can get O2 because they are corresponding angles. So angle O2 would also be 66. Why? Corresponding angles. Please remember to name the parallel lines. PM parallel to OR. Once again, two marks. A mark for the answer and a mark for the reason. And let's go fill in our 66. Our last one on this one. 8.1.5. They're asking for angle N. Two. So let's see, how can we get angle N2? We need to have angle N2. O is the center of the circle, which means we know ON and OR are radii, which means that angle ONR will be the same size as angle OR 
n. So let's start by writing that down. I'm just going to move us over to this side, 8.1.5. Angle O, R, N must be the same size as angle R, N, O. Why? It's angles opposite equal sides. And remember, good practice is to fill in that you know that O, R and O, N were the same because they were radii. So if I know both of these angles are the same size and my triangle must add up to 180, I have the 66, which means if I go 180 minus 66 and I divide it by 2 to get each of the base angles, I know that angle RON, sorry, RNO must be equal to 57 degrees because of the sum of the angles of a triangle. So I know this entire one is 57. If they only want N2, now it's simple. I can go N2 is the 57 minus the 24 I had. And that means that is 33 degrees. Three marks. Where did the three marks go? A mark for the statement that the base angles were equal with the reason. Then a mark for getting the 57 with the sum of the angles in a triangle. And then a mark for your final answer. Our formulas from grade 11 from analytical geometry appears on our formula sheet, but we do need to know what they are for. The distance formula is given to you as well as the midpoint formula. We have our gradient formula and please remember with perpendicular lines, when we multiply the two gradients, we should get an answer of negative one. And with parallel lines, my two gradients will be equal. We also have the formula for the angle of inclination where tan of theta is equal to my gradient. Grade 12s, there is a separate video specifically just on the grade 11 analytical geometry. Please make sure that you do view this video as well. Our grade 12 formulas that we have learned this year has got to do with circles. I've got two formulas to determine the, um, the equation of a circle. If the midpoint of the circle is at the origin, so it's at 0, 0, we can use the equation x squared plus y squared equals r squared. Please remember the radius of the circle is only r and not r squared. And if the midpoint is not at the origin, we use the formula x minus a squared plus y minus b in brackets squared equals r squared. And remember the midpoint of the circle is then the coordinate a and b. So I can give you the equation of a circle and I can ask you to go use the completing the square to write it in standard form. So how do we go about doing this? First of all, we group our x terms and we group our y terms and we move our constants to the other side. So I've put all the x's together and I've left space. I've put all the y terms together, I've left space and I've moved my constant to the other side. And now I have to complete the square. So how do I complete the square? I add half of whatever the coefficient of the x is, so half of 4, I'm going to say 4 over 2, and I square it. And I do the same for the y's. I add half of the coefficient of the y term, which would be 8, 8 over 2, and I square it. But remember, an equation has to balance. If you do it on the left, you have to do it on the right. So I must add the same numbers on the right as well. But I can now say, 4 over 2 is 2, and 2 squared is 4, and 8 over 2 is 4, and 4 squared is 16. And then I have to factorize it. So I factorize my first trinomial, and that would be x plus 2 squared, and I factorize my y trinomial, and that would be plus 8 minus 4 squared equals, if I add up my terms on the right hand side, I get 4. And there I've made sure I can write the equation for my circle in standard form. So if I look from here, what would the midpoint of this circle be? It would be negative 2 and 4. What would the radius be? Be careful, the radius is not 4 because that is r squared. The radius would be 2. So let's go and look at past papers. In November 2015, they gave us the following sketch. 
They said in the diagram below, the circle with the center M24 passes through the coordinate C, negative 1, 2, and cuts the y-axis at E. The diameter CMD is drawn and ACB is a tangent to a circle. First question for three marks. Determine the equation of the circle in the form x minus a squared plus y minus b in bracket squared equals r squared. So let's go write this down for ourselves. They want it as x minus a in a bracket squared plus y minus b in a bracket squared equals r squared. Remember, that's the coordinates of the center of my circle, which I've got. So I can immediately go it's x minus 2 squared plus y minus 4 squared equals r squared. Now I've got to calculate my radius. I can calculate my radius by substituting in a point on the circumference of the circle and I have a point to sub in. So I can substitute in 1, 2. So I'm going to go negative 1 minus 2 squared plus 2 minus 4 squared would give me my radius squared. And that calculates to be 13 is equal to my radius squared. So my equation is x minus 2 squared plus y minus 4 squared is equal to 13. And that was three marks. So where are the three marks allocated? It's a mark for the substituting in of the negative 1, 2, a mark for the x minus 2 in bracket squared plus the y minus 4 in bracket squared, and then a mark for making it equal to 13. Question 4.1.2. They ask us, write down the coordinates of D. So we don't have to calculate, we have to write it down. Now the way I do is, remember, CMD is on a straight line. So I check how did my X's and my Y's move? What was the difference? My X at C was negative 1 and my X at M was 2. That is a horizontal move of 3, which means that must also be 3. My Y's go from 2 to 4. That's a vertical move of 2, so that must also be 2. So if I move 3 units on from 2, that would give me 5. And if I move 2 units up from 4, that would give me 6. So D is the coordinate, 5, 6. And you'll see it's just 2 marks. The 2 marks goes for the 5 and the 6 in the coordinate form. Question 4.1.3. They ask us to determine the equation of line AB in the form y equals mx plus c. Okay. So I need to get the equation of line AB. First of all, it's a straight line, which means I need its gradient. But I don't have two coordinates on it to determine its gradient. But I can get the gradient from CM. And why is that important? Because what do we know about a radius? A radius is always perpendicular to a tangent. So that would help me. So let's start by getting the gradient of line MC. How does gradient work again? Y2 minus Y1 over X2 minus X1. Good practice is to write down your coordinates for yourself on the side, which you're going to use. I've got C, which is negative 1, 2, and M, which is 2, Okay, so my second y coordinate will be 4. I'm going to go 4 minus 2 over my second x will be 2 minus, please remember it's a negative 1, so substitute it into a bracket. So my gradient works out to be 2 over 3. Remember, what do I know? A radius is perpendicular to a tangent. And what do I know about perpendicular lines? If I multiply the gradients, I should get negative 1. So the gradient of AB must thus be negative 3 over 2. And I always just write in here on the side for myself that MC is perpendicular to AB. Y, a tangent, is perpendicular to a radius. I'm always just careful and I write it in. So I know that now. So we have the gradient already. So Y equals negative 3 over 2X plus C. 
I still need my C value. Do I have a coordinate on the straight line to sub in? Yes, I can sub in negative 1, 2. So I'm going to substitute in negative 1, 2. Let's just move that up a bit. So 2 equals negative 3 over 2 times negative 1 plus C. And that means C works out to be a half. So what is my final formula? Y is equal to negative 3 over 2X plus a half. That was a five mark question. Where were the five marks allocated? For calculating the gradient of MC, then getting the gradient of AB. For substituting in a coordinate, calculating C and getting the final answer. Let's go see what our next question says. Let's go look at November 2021. They give us this question. They say, in the diagram, the circle centered at N, which is negative 1, 3, passes through the coordinate A, negative 1, 1, and C. B is the coordinate negative 4, 2. C, D, and E are joined to form a parallelogram such that BE is parallel to the x-axis, so BE is parallel to the x-axis, CD is a tangent to the circle, and CD is 6 units long. Our first question, 4.1. They ask me, write down the length of the radius of the circle, and it's only one mark, so I must just write it down. Remember, that's the center of the circle. Do you have a point on the circumference? Yes. And you can see the x values here are exactly the same. They're both negative 1. So what is the radius? If I go from the y is 3 to negative 1, how many units is that? That is 4 units. So the radius is 4. One mark just for the answer. 4.2.2. They ask me to calculate the coordinate of C. So let's see. What do we know about C? C is also on the circumference. And I know that the C is exactly the same as the H on the opposite side. So immediately I know that the X value by C is negative 1. I know my X value is negative 1. I also know that this is the midpoint, and that's a point on the circumference, so that will be a radius. So that also has to be 4 units up. What is 4 units up from 3? It would be 7. So it's negative 1, 7. 2 marks just for the 2 answers. Why? Because remember, a radius is always perpendicular to a tangent. Question 4.2.2. They ask us the coordinates of point D. Okay, what do we know about point D? First of all, this is a parallel line. It would help us if we wrote in our coordinate of C, which was negative 1 and 7. If CD is a parallel line, my Y value will be exactly the same. So my Y value must be 7. So I know my Y value must be 7. What will my X value be? They told me that CD is 6 units long. So my X's must move on 6. Negative 1 plus 6 is 5. So D is the coordinate 5, 7. One mark for 5 and one mark for 7. As simple as that. November 2020. This was our sketch given. They've told us M is the coordinate negative 3, 4, is the center of the larger circle, and a point on the smaller circle having a, cent having a center O at 0, 0, so it's at the origin. From N, negative 11, P, a tangent is drawn to touch the larger circle at T, with NT, NT parallel to the y-axis. Nm is a tangent to the smaller circle with at Nm is a tangent to the smaller circle at M with MOS as a diameter. So MOS is the diameter of the smaller circle.
First question, determine the equation of the smaller circle for two marks. So let's go see. We know the smaller circle has its center at the origin. So we can go use the formula x squared plus y squared equals r squared. Do I have a point on the circumference to substitute in? Yes. So I can substitute in negative 3, 4. So I'm going to go 4 squared plus in brackets negative 3 squared equals my radius squared. And that means 25 equals r squared. So the formula is x squared plus y squared equals 25. It was two marks. A mark for the substituting in and a mark for the final answer. Question 4.2. Determine the equation of the circle centered at M in the form X minus A in bracket squared plus Y minus B in bracket squared equals R squared. So let's go see. X minus A in bracket squared plus Y minus B in bracket squared equals R squared. Do I have the center? Yes. So I can immediately go. It's X minus negative 3. A negative and a negative makes a positive. Plus Y minus 4 squared equals R squared. Now I need a point to sub in. Do I have a point to sub in at this point? No. But what do I know? I know that Tn is a tangent. And what do you know about a tangent and a radius? They are always perpendicular. So I know that Tn must be perpendicular to Mt if I had the radius Mt. Why? A tangent is always perpendicular to a radius. How does that help me? That helps me determine what can I see, what I can determine here. I also know that is parallel. So I know what the x value by coordinate t is. I know the x value by coordinate t must be negative 11. I do not know what the y is. That I have to solve out. So let's go see if I can figure out what is the y of this one. What would be the radius? Does it help me at all if I can figure out what is the radius? Let's see. I can use my x values to get my radius. My x was at negative 3. I moved to negative 11, which means my radius must be, that is, 8 units. The radius must be 8. From negative 3 to negative 11 is 8. So, what is my final formula? x plus 3 squared plus y minus 4 squared equals radius squared. The radius, what, 8? 8 squared is 64. And that was 3 marks. So, where does the 3 marks come in? The first mark they are giving for you that you said that these ones were parallel, perpendicular, and then you got that the radius was 8. Then a mark for the left side of the equation, filling in the 3 and the negative 4, and then for getting to 64. Question 4.3. Determine the equation of line Nm in the form y equals mx plus c. Once again, Nm, they told us in the beginning, was a tangent to the smaller circle. So I need to get the Radi the gradient first of MO because a radius is perpendicular to a tangent. So let's go get the gradient of line MO. Y2 minus Y1 over X2 minus X1. I'm going to use the coordinates M, which is negative 3, 4, and the coordinate O, which is 0, 0. So if I substitute in, I'm going to go 0 minus 4, and 0 minus, in brackets, negative 3. So that gives me negative 4 over 3. So immediately, I know that the gradient of line Mn will be 3 over 4. Why? Once again, a radius is perpendicular to a tangent. So I just write it in for myself. The radius was perpendicular to the tangent. 
Okay, so let's continue. So we've got y equals 3 over 4x plus c. Do I have a coordinate that this line goes through? Yes, it goes through line point n, so I can substitute that in. So I'm going to substitute in the coordinate negative 3, 4. So 4 equals 3 over 4 times negative 3 plus c. So c works out to be 25 over 4. So my equation is y equals 3 over 4x plus 25 over 4. And this question counted 4 marks. So where did our 4 marks work go? First one for calculating the gradient of MO, then the gradient of MN, then for substituting in the coordinate and getting the final answer. Okay, grade 12s, let's move on. November 2019. We were given this question. It says in the diagram, a circle center M touches the X axis at A, the coordinate negative 1, 0, and the Y axis at B, 0, 1. A smaller circle centered N, a negative a half and 3 over 2, passes through M and cuts the, and cuts the larger circle at B and C. B and C is a diameter of the smaller circle. A tangent to the smaller circle at C cuts the x-axis at D. First question. Determine the equation of the circle centered M in the form x minus a in bracket squared plus y minus b in bracket squared equals r squared. So first of all, I need to know what is coordinate M. But remember, you are touching, cutting the y-axis by b, and you're cutting the x-axis by a. So immediately I know what the x-value is. It's negative 1. And I know what the y-value is. It's 1. So m is the coordinate, negative 1, 1. So I can fill that in immediately. So it's x minus negative 1. So that's plus 1 squared plus y minus 1 squared equals what is my radius? What is this distance? If I'm moving from negative 1 to 0, my radius is 1, and 1 squared is 1. So there is my equation. That was a very quick and easy 3 marks. So where are the 3 marks? It does. Let's write down the coordinate as well that we knew m was negative 1 and 1. Always good to write everything down. So you get a mark for writing down that you knew m was negative 1 and 1, then a mark for the x plus 1 in bracket squared, and the y minus 1 in bracket squared, and a mark for the 1. 4.2. Calculate the coordinates of c. So now I have to get the coordinates of c. What I can do is I can use the fact that they told me that c in b is the diameter, we know n is the middle, so I can use midpoint formula. So I can do my midpoint formula in the reverse. How does the midpoint formula work again? x1 plus x2 over 2 and y1 plus y2 over 2. I'm going to go do the x's first. So I'm going to go call this x and y. So x plus 0 over 2 and I know what the middle is. The middle is negative a half, equals negative a half, which means x plus 0 must be equal to negative 1. So x must be negative 1. Let's go do the y's. y plus 1 over 2 must be equal to what was the middle? 3 over 2, which means y plus 1 must be equal to 3, so y must be equal to 2. So C is the coordinate, negative 1, 2. Let's write that in. Negative 1, 2. You would have seen that counted two marks. It was just a mark for the negative 1 and the 2. There were different ways to get it, but I thought I would show you the one with the midpoint. Question 4.3. They ask us to show that the equation of the tangent CD, the tangent CD, is given by y minus x equals 3. Let's just fill in here that we've got worked out c was negative 1, 2. Okay, once again, 
They're asking me the equation of a tangent, which means I need the gradient of the radius first. A radius is perpendicular to a tangent. So let's go get the gradient of the radius in C first. Y2 minus Y1 over X2 minus X1. Let's write down our coordinates. We are going to be using, I've got the coordinate C, which is negative 1, 2, and N, which is the coordinate negative for half and 3 over 2. So, 3 over 2, minus 2, negative for half, minus negative 1. And my radius gradient works out to be negative 1. So what does that mean? It means that the gradient of DC, if I multiply the gradients of perpendicular lines, I must get 1. So the gradient of DC must be 1. Why? A tangent is perpendicular to a radius. Just add it for ourselves. So we know the equation is Y is equal to 1X plus C. Do I have a coordinate to sub in? Yes, I can sub in C, which we calculated was negative 1 and 2. So let's go sub in negative 1, 2. 2 equals 1 times negative 1 plus C. So C calculates to be 3. So what is my equation? Y equals 1X or just X plus 3. Is that the form they've got it in? No, they had the X on the left. So let's move it. Y minus X equals 3. And now we have their form. Okay, this counted four marks. A mark for calculating the gradient of NC, then a mark for the gradient of DC, a mark for the substituting in of the coordinate, and then a mark for the final two. There we go, grade 12s. Okay, our next one, November 2018. They've given us this picture, and they said, in the diagram, the equation of the circle with center F and they give me the equation of the circle. So if is x minus 3 in bracket squared plus y minus 1 in bracket squared equals r squared. They haven't given me the radius. S, the coordinate 6, 5 is a point on the circle with center F. Another circle with center G, which has the coordinates N, N. In the fourth quadrant, touches the circle with center F. And H such that FH to HG is 1 to 2. This is very important. It means FA that HG is twice as long as FH. That's why they said it. So whatever FH is, HG is twice as long. The point J lies in the first quadrant such that AJ is a common tangent. So HJ is a common tangent to both of the circles. JK is a tangent to the larger circle. So immediately do you see both the tangents come from the same place? First question, 4.1. Write down the coordinates of F. Why are they only asking me to write down the coordinates of F? Because remember they told you the equation is X minus 3 squared plus Y minus 1 squared equals R squared. So you can immediately write down the coordinates of F. It will be 3 and 1. And you'll see it's only two marks. Where do the two marks go? A mark for the 3 and a mark for the 1. Question 4.2. Calculate the length of Fs. So now they want to know how long is Fs. Remember, we now know what coordinate F is. It is 3 and 1. So how can I calculate the length of Fs? I can use the distance formula. Fs equals, how does the distance formula look again? x2 minus x1 squared plus y2 minus y1 squared. So let's go substitute in. We are going to have 6 minus 3 squared plus 5 minus 1 squared. And I'm going to take the square root of that and my answer works out to be 5. Two marks. A mark for the substitution and a mark for the answer. So now we know F is that the radius is 5. Very important. Remember that now that the radius is 5 for the smaller circle. 4.3.
write down the length of HG. Okay, I now need to write down the length of HG, but only write it down, not calculate it. Why is this important? We just worked out the radius is 5. So if FS is 5, FH is 5. What did they tell me in the beginning? FH to HG is 1 to 2. So if this one, HG is twice as long as FH, which means HD 2 times 5 is 10. One mark. The radius is 10. 4.4. Give a reason why JH is equal to JK. They are tangents from the same point. So that's it. Tans from same point. One mark. They are testing my theory. That's it. 4.5.1. Determine the distance FJ. So they want to know the length, the distance of FJ. With reasons, if it's given that JK is 20. So if JK is 20, and these are tans from the same point, it means JH is 20. And if they now want the distance of FJ, I can use Pythagoras. Why can I use Pythagoras? Because a tangent is always perpendicular to a radius. So let's start by writing that down. Angle FHJ must be 90 degrees why a tangent is perpendicular to a radius and now i can do pythagoras so if j squared equals 20 squared plus 5 squared please don't forget to write that you are using pythagoras and that means if j works out to be the square root of 425 or you can give it to me as a decimal which is 20,62 we do not mind four marks a marks for saying that angle fhj is 90 with the reason for the mark then a mark for your statement of pythagoras with stating pythagoras and then a mark for the final answer so let's go fill it in here i'm going to use square root of 425 Question 4.5.2. They want me, let's just move that a bit, to the equation of the circle with center G in terms, we'll read this very carefully, in terms of M and N in the form. So there must be an M and N in the answer. So what do I know? They want it in x minus a squared plus y minus b in bracket squared equals r squared. G is the coordinate m, n. They want it in terms of m and n, which means I must put the m and the n in the equation. So it's going to be x minus m squared plus y minus n squared. Do I know what the radius is? Have I worked out the radius before? Yes, I have. It was gh. Remember, we calculated Hg was 10. The formula says radius squared. 10 squared is a 100. And that is one mark. So it's a mark for just writing it in that form. Question 4.5.3. Quite a lengthy question. Seven marks. Now they want the coordinates of G. If it is further given that the equation of the tangent Jk is x is equal to 22, which means x is 22 here, which means by k, we know the x value is 22, we just don't know what the y value is. So let's see, what can we do? k, we know, is 22, we don't know what its y is. We do know what our radius is. Our radius is how much again? 10. So if I go 10 units back from 22, I know what m is. 22 minus 10, m is 12. So immediately I know m is 12. So let's write this down. We know the radius was 10, which means, and a radius was perpendicular to a tangent. So jk was perpendicular to kj. 
radius perpendicular to tangent, which means m had to be 12. Immediately we have that already. So now, how can I calculate what is m? Well, we know that if h and j are collinear, it means they write, lie on a, say, the same line. So let's write that down. If h and j are collinear, it means they lie in the same straight line. And what have they made me calculate before? They've made me calculate that h, j was 10 units. I now know m is 12. I have that coordinate. I have this entire distance is 15. So I can use the distance formula to help me. So I can go, okay, distance formula. If I want the distance of fg, I'm going to say it's the square root of x1 minus x2 squared plus y1 minus y2 squared. What am I going to use? The coordinates of f and g. f is 3, 1. g is 12. And I don't know what the n is. I'm going to leave it as an n. So let's go substitute that in. So if I substitute that in, I am going to have 15 equals the square root of 3 minus 12 squared plus 1 minus n squared. How do I get rid of a square root? I square both sides. Remember, to get rid of a square root, you have to square both sides so that that can cancel. 15 squared is 225. 3 minus 12 is not, negative 9 squared is 81. Plus, let's multiply out this bracket. Remember, if you're struggling, rather write the bracket out twice. If you can do it in your head, you're welcome to. So, 225 equals 81 plus 1 minus n minus n is minus 2n plus n squared. And this now looks like a trinomial. So, let's go write it in standard form. I'm going to do everything on the right. So n squared minus 2n, 81 plus 1 is 82, minus 225 is minus 143, and that equals 0. And now I can factorize my trinomial. Grade 12s, you can factorize it normally, or you're welcome to use the formula. Just remember, if you use the quadratic formula, you have to show your substitution. If I factorize it normally, it's n plus 11. And n minus 13, which means n could have been negative 11 or n could have been 13. And now I have to go look on my sketch. Which one is it? Is it negative 11 or 13? What is my n values here on my sketch? The n represents the y's. Are the y's positive or negative here? The y's are negative. So it can't be that one. It can't be the 13. So n must be negative 11, which means g must be the coordinate 12 and negative 11. That was quite a bit of work. It was quite a lengthy sum. It was seven marks. So where did the seven marks go? The first mark went for knowing that k had an x value of 22. And then for calculating that m was 12 from there. Then for substituting into your distance formula and for making the fg 15. For writing it into standard form. Let's see, that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Then for calculating that n is negative 11 and not 13, you have to have both of them. And then for your final coordinate, that gives us our seven marks. Like I said, grade 12s, that was quite a lengthy sum. There is a link to the past papers at the bottom of this video. You are welcome to click on it. It will take you to the WCED portal that has all the past papers as well as all the memos available for you. From me, Tarin Cox, who's presenting the English lessons, and Elaine van Amad, who's presenting the Afrikaans lessons. We wish you good luck, and remember, the only way to learn mathematics is to do mathematics.